Thank you very much. That was very powerful. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. And it feeds in, I think, to some comments that I want to make in my 15 minutes. Okay. Am I too loud? Yeah. I'm the woman in black, but don't ask me any questions. <laughs> I'm the woman in pink because my message is that we, as professionals, have to change. We have to be out there. We have to be in the public. Uh, I'm speaking to you as an outlier. I'm a consultant. I have been for 30-something years. I don't work in any one institution. I have seen many. Um, and so I will talk to you from the perspective of someone who has a lot of experience with what goes on in different places around the world, in Canada and internationally. Uh, and I want to talk about the changing nature of archival collection, collecting. And I think the first thing is, we could spend a whole day talking about what do we mean by the word archives. Um, I am taking a very, very broad definition. There are people, for example, who would say that oral recording, powerful as it is, is not archives. And I would say, this is what we need to change in our own minds and in the minds of the public. So what I'm going to talk about in my little bit of time is what are the challenges that we face? What is it that is driving the need for change? And then what do I think needs to change? And I've selected a few issues that I see as most important. And then what are some strategies that might be uh, taken? One of the things I was asked uh, to, in this presentation was to bring forward examples of best practice that I could share. And I said, I'm a consultant. I don't go in to see good things. I'm brought in because something's going wrong. <laughs> So you will not see examples of the organizations I've worked with necessarily. Uh, so those are the three things I'm going to talk about. And uh, what I will do is give some examples of institutions that I do see as, as doing innovative work uh, that might highlight some suggestions that McGill might want to think about. So the challenge. The challenge is the digital. The challenge is that we used to have the mantra of archival management was we acquire, we preserve, and we make available. It was very linear, it was very process oriented. I sometimes liken it to shopping or grocery stores. You used to go down the high street and you'd go into the butcher and the baker and you'd find your materials. Then we had superstores and we had grocery stores. You could get it all in one place. Then we had Amazon. So what does that do to supply chain management, right? You, you no longer go place to place to place and the grocer has to acquire the lettuce, put it on the shelf and then you buy it. Now people can say, I want my lettuce and someone can go and pick it that moment and say, I will now deliver it to you just on time. So we face the same problem with the digital age. We face the fact that we can no longer go through the acquire, preserve and make available linear process because records are not being created that way, they're not being used that way. This is where they are, and this is where they live, and we have got to find a way to convince the creators of records that they've got to get it out of their technology and into some sort of safe place, whether it is in a custodial environment, a third party or not, in some manner before it's too late. And before it's too late is sometimes three months or six months from the point of creation. I have said that, did, that paper is patient. It will sit and wait for you for decades. But digital is like a three-year-old child. It will run away in the store and you can't catch it. So we have got to look at how are we going to change everything we do in terms of managing the digital because we cannot wait for it to come to us. The other thing that we have to deal with is that we now live in a world where trust and truth are challenged because of the digital. Uh, and because people have information in their pockets, because they can be fed fake news, we have all these situations where we say, we have got to find a way of capturing and preserving the accurate, authentic record in an age where it could be manipulated immediately. The moment it's created, it could be changed. How do we know that it's authentic? So these are the challenges that we face, and I have some suggestions in my experience for what archivists have to think about in terms of addressing those. Um, the first is that we have to change our message, and I'll talk more about all of these. We have to change our language, which means in some ways we have to change our vision. We have to focus on the digital. 
we, we can wait. Paper can wait for a while, but we cannot let the digital wait. So we have to think about how do we manage the new record, even though our whole world has circulated around the old record. And we have to help with making good records in the first place, not just preserving records after the fact. And we need to engage new audiences. And here I'm going to talk about archives, but I think there's a major difference that I don't have time to talk about today between institutional records and collected archives. And I think there are many differences in how those are approached in terms of management. So, we have to erase the records versus archives binary. Archives are not old. If we don't manage records today, we won't have archives tomorrow. So, I often talk about how we have to change our language. I don't talk about archives as history anymore. I talk about three things. I say archives are the sources of documentary evidence for accountability, identity, and memory. Whatever works, whatever language works for whatever audience, I use it. So I might talk about knowledge, information, records, archives, data. Data with evidential value. That, oh, that works really well in the order. Um, so I don't, I, you could call it a banana. If we can get people to understand there is something that needs to be preserved for evidential value, and that evidential value is not just legal accountability. It could also be corporate or institutional or individual memory. Uh, it could also be the sense of identity. If I can get that message across, I don't care what words I use in the room to communicate that. We also have to focus on preservation of the digital. And this linear approach I talk about is just not going to work. We cannot wait for someone to create it and then decide it's worth keeping. We've got to go out there as the uh, work at the welcome is go out and say, what's out there? But even more than that, we need to say, are you creating records that you think are going to be valuable? Which is where people like me, consultants, and there are nowhere near enough of us out there. And I was a huge outlier when I started this, and I only started it because I hated dressing up and really wanted to work at home in my slippers. Um, we need more people who are going to be brokers, who are going to be advisors, who are going to be guides to say, you may be creating records that are valuable. Let me tell you what you need to think about. Let me tell you that Facebook is not an archival repository. People are getting the message that Facebook is maybe not the best place to put your stuff. And so I think there's a lot of strategy around partnerships and collaboration and outreach. So we can't preserve the record if we don't make it in the first place. So we need to, particularly in institutions, and I, call, I talk about high-risk institutions, we need to tell people, you have to make a record. There is an effort in Canada now to, for the Access and Privacy Commissioners to change the law to talk about the duty to document. I am absolutely fully in favor of this for the high-risk institutions for governments. I don't believe that individuals should be told you have to make a record. I think that is our choice. But in the institutional environment, I think we need to say, look, if you are a government that is making decisions with our money and our people and our society, you have to explain it, and that we do that by creating a record. That means we need to look at opportunities for awareness raising. And one of my biggest disappointments with my profession is that we are not out there in front of news items. And I happened to be in England when the Windrush scandal was happening. Uh, which is, is comparable to the DACA in the United, issue in the United States, where you have un, theoretically undocumented people in the country who are being told to leave. In the UK, these people actually were English, they, but they couldn't find their transport, transfer papers or their passenger list or something that said that they had the right to be in the country. Where are we with truth and reconciliation in Canada, with Cambridge Analytica, with all of these teachable moments? We have constant teachable moments. Donald Trump is our biggest teachable moment you can possibly have. And we should be seizing this opportunity to say, how can we convince the people that what's happening here is evidence, that a tweet is evidence, that a Facebook post is evidence, and that this needs to be protected with its authenticity intact. My own little plug is that what Laura does when she gets fed up is she writes a book. So I'm writing a book now that will be for the public on why evidence matters. And I think, I hope, that I can kind of distill some of my anger and get it out in prose that isn't too hostile. <laughs> Not too hostile. 
Um, now, Jennifer said that change is painful. Change is very painful. Uh, and the other thing when it's painful is that we have to take into account the socio-cultural realities, the geographic realities of where we are. The next part of my talk, as I conclude, is to look at some examples of where I think we may see potential for change. But a lot of these are driven by very different geographic circumstances or socio-cultural circumstances, so they won't necessarily work all across the board. But I think, I hope that what McGill might do is look at these as case studies to consider further. So what are some of the strategies for change and what are some of the activities I've seen elsewhere? National Archives of Australia has started a program called Keep the Knowledge, Make a Record. And it's very successful with government, with saying, we need to convince you that you have to make a record. That cartoon I showed was from their promotional leaflets. Interestingly, I was at a conference once where I talked to the National Archivist. They had formerly had a program called DIRCS, or Designing and Implementing Record Keeping Systems. He said it was a complete failure. And he said the reason it was a failure was that it was focused on the record keeper, not on the record creator. He said, all of the people in government said, well, you're just trying to make your job easier. You're not trying to make my job easier. And he said, we threw the whole thing out. We started again. And they started with keep the knowledge, make a record. And they focused on awareness raising and training and guidance, never mind the classification and the retention. They said, we'll take care of that. We we'll want you to know the importance of making a record. Library and Archives Canada, yay, Library and Archives Canada. Um, <laughs> This is one of the geographic realities of Canada. We're huge. Library and Archives Canada has started opening service points across the country. This is not just a convenience. This is a public awareness opportunity. This is a service opportunity. I think it's great. Uh, the CoLab is a, is a crowdsourcing collaborative tool that is digital, that is online, which also supports the nature of a country with not a lot of people spread over thousands of miles. And I personally think that the effort to digitize World War I personnel files is absolutely fantastic. It gives people, I, people are sitting waiting for Twitter saying how many hundred, it's 100,000, 600,000 I think by the end. And they say we're 50% we're finished, we're 60% finished, we're 80% finished. And people, it's like a cheerleading team watching a game coming to the end, we're thrilled. And I think it's an enormous tool, not just for preservation and access, but for outreach and awareness raising, because World War I and the Canadian service in the war is such a topic with our anniversaries. My father used to say when I complained about you know, not getting a lot of attention, he said, well, you got your mother's genes, you're short. Some people just get good luck. The city of Amsterdam got really good luck. Their archives is in a former trading house and bank building in downtown Amsterdam, and it is spectacularly gorgeous. It is amazing. So what do they do with it? They hold conferences. They took out a whole bunch of space they could have used for storage, and they start holding conferences instead. Get the people into the building. I think it's brilliant. Another thing, BB, uh, where did my BBC go? Oh, National Archives. Uh, educational and teaching tools for students. They do an enormous amount of outreach through their website for the UK. And BBC has the Reminiscence Archives. I love this. This is working on dementia support. The recognition that archives can be used for dementia support. What are we doing about the not the usual suspects in the archival world? What are we doing about in, in Vancouver? We have the downtown east side. A program was started for the poorest part of Canada for people to take photographs and document their stories and then archive the photographs. So we have the archival record, but we have engagement by the public in the community by saying, we recognize that you exist. You live on the street. We value you. You exist, and we want to know your story. So who's out there that we're not talking to, that we should talk to? And lastly, uh, Denmark is doing enormous things, not only in government records management, but also in transcription, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. And again, I don't think this is as much about money as it is about public engagement, about saying to the public, we want you to be part of what we're trying to do. And even if somebody says, well, I don't think we should be asking the public for money, I'd say, well, ask them and then let them get mad because they think it should be paid for otherwise. Don't just not ask them and complain because you don't have any money. 
So the linear will not work anymore. I think we have got to change how we think. We've got to turn everything upside down. We've got to have a new approach to acquire, preserve, and make available. The future may not be custodial, but as long as it is preserved safely somewhere for the public to use, I'm pretty happy. Thank you very much.